Hey, hello everybody. Uh, welcome. We're coming to you today um, nationally. So good morning and uh, good afternoon, wherever you are. Uh, my name is Oscar Vergara, and I am um, uh, hosting this uh, presentation today. And uh, today we have uh, a couple of uh, of uh, really nice presenters. Uh, we have Alex Kodaru, and we have uh, Ashima Sumaru Jerf. Um, we're going to present to you today on decolonization, and uh, I'll let you uh, introduce yourselves in, in a moment here. Uh, just to go over a couple of uh, housekeeping items is uh, we have a Q&A uh, uh, box uh, available to you. So if you could use that to put in your questions, um, we'll be happy to answer them. So I will, uh, I will moderate the um, that box. Uh, please avoid using the actual chat box because it, it, uh, we won't be uh, using that one in particular to answer your questions. So the Q&A uh, box can be found. There's a button at the bottom of your screen. If you click on Q&A, uh, you can put your um, your questions in, in there and we'll be happy to answer. So welcome again and thanks for joining us. Um, our first presenter is uh, my colleague and friend, uh, Alex Kaldarari, and he is uh, going to present to you on decolonization, as I said, and it's entitled Towards uh, Decolonized Practice in Settlement Work. So go ahead, Alex, take it away. Awesome. Thank you so much, Oscar. Um, nice to see you here today. Nice to see you as well, Ashima. And thank you to everybody who has taken the time from wherever you are to uh, to join us today for this, uh, this conversation that's really, really important. Um, and what I hope is the uh, is part of an ongoing series of conversations that we can never have too many times in uh, in a place like Canada. Um, so I, um, I won't go too far into depth into who I am or everything, but I will just throw that up there. I will say that part of the, the reason that I, I'm really excited to be here today is I'm, I'm a big proponent of sharing experiences that have really shaped the person I have become as time has gone on. And part of that uh, involves sharing some pretty difficult life lessons and the results of some pretty difficult conversations. I do identify as an immigrant and I do, as such I do identify as a settler and I think for much of my life growing up here like many of us uh, who have grown up in Canada there we have a relatively complicated relationship with Canada's colonial history um, and I think that this process is very individualized, but at the same time, a big part, uh, you know, of what it means to be part of our communities, and what it means to be a citizen and a resident of what we call Canada. I call this my part of the presentation and, and this panel discussion towards decolonized settlement practice. While I can't speak for the expertise of my esteemed panelists and my friends, um, I, for myself, I can say that I am not an expert in decolonization. I am not an expert in decolonized practice. What I can say is that um, I'm willing to learn. And I think I have an obligation as a, settle, as a settler to learn. And I think as somebody who works in a field and supports newcomers with the transition to life in Canada, I have a responsibility to ensure that the mistakes that were made in the past and many of the harmful practices from the past are not recreated for the future. So that is why we're calling this towards decolonized settlement work practice. This is the first steps. Maybe some folks have already taken even more steps. Maybe others have not started down that journey. And all of that is okay. But the idea is to start these conversations. And if we can provide some tips, some tools, some strategies, some kernels of wisdom that have been shared with us, it is all the much more, uh, all the much more important. Um, so I am situated out of Edmonton. Um, I work in uh, at Northwest College, which is um, 
the a large community college in downtown Edmonton, which is located on Treaty 6 territory, which encompasses the uh, traditional territories of numerous Indigenous nations, including the Cree, Dene, Stony Nakota, Sioux, Soto, Métis, and Ojibwe nations. But I think it's also really important to recognize that these nations predated the treaty systems and predated the treaty, uh, um, um, the treaty making processes. So. I like to say that as part of, a, of an introduction to anything that I do. Um, I am going to end my presentation and start my presentation with a couple of different exercises. One kind of more for everyone here to just kind of think about in the back of their minds. And the other will actually have an opportunity to do a little bit, have a little bit more interaction in. So as you go through this, I invite you to actually keep in mind given the fact that many of us in this room are working in the settlement sector, are researching um, you know, the phenomena of settlement and integration and theorizing about how to support newcomers and theorize migration. What does it mean to be Canadian to you? How did you come up with those values that you call Canadian or Canadian values? And I invite you to keep that question running through your mind as I go through my portion of the presentation, because I think it really does cut at the very heart of what we mean when we say we want to uh, engage in a settlement work practice that is a little bit more decolonized. So I ask you to think about what, what Canadian values means. And I think it's really, really important to kind of go on that a little bit here and, and expand on that. Um, many of us in Canada, especially those who've lived here, grown up here, um, will be well, well acquainted with the term the great American myth. And the great American myth is the idea that the United States of America is a meritocracy where if you work hard, make the right decisions, make all the right choices in life, you will succeed. And you will succeed in ways that you know, will reward you financially, spiritually, psychosocially, whatever the case may be. Um, and ultimately, it's a responsabilization of success. You are chiefly responsible. But it doesn't account for systemic marginalization that does exist within so-called meritocratic societies, things like poverty, racism, the feminized glass ceiling, homophobia, et cetera, et cetera. So many Canadians are well familiar with, uh, with those contradictions. However, uh, Miller contends that we have our own version of the myth um, that, I, that I have taken to calling the great Canadian myth that the existence of multiculturalism in Canada at a policy level and at a social level denotes an absence of systemic racism. After all, if Canada is a country built and sustained by immigrants, how can it be racist, right? We are a multicultural country. We have heard this, this phrase, I'm sure many of us have heard it at numerous points over the years. Because we are so multicultural and because we have people coming from all over the world wanting to come here, how can we be racist? It's not possible. I'd be willing to bet that many of you in uh, watching today um, will beg to differ. So if we're willing to acknowledge that systemic racism does exist in Canada, then how does this origin, how does this persistent myth of the multicultural land free of racism, where does it come from? Shireen Tabani um, wrote a fascinating book in 2007 called Exalted Subjects, The Making of Race in Canada. And she suggests that in popular discourse to be Canadian, one must be law abiding, enterprising, caring, compassionate, and committed to the values of diversity and multiculturalism. In addition, Tabani suggests that contemporary Canadian identity stems from this idea that the nation's original settlers formed the formed uh, what would eventually become Canada. And as a result, you know, you he, uh, there there was supposedly great adversity that was overcome both in terms of the perilous journey that came to come to Canada, plus the sometimes inhospitable climate. And yes, um, the, uh, the, the conception of relations between Indigenous peoples and the first European settlers were not always very kind either. But on a more deeper level, 
what actually wound up happening was that with the original settlers, European systems of governance were brought with them. And there was a great deal of importance placed on how the rational thought behind these systems of governance led to the development of what we would call the national subject or citizen, as it were. So other ways of thinking and being, particularly those of non-Western immigrants or indigenous peoples were seen as foreign or threatening, right? It was, and you see this in the language of the enlightenment often coming on saying that, you know, the rational way, the scientific way, it is the non-emotional way um, that forms the basis of how civilization, quote unquote, has come about. So these lawful, industrious, and yes, God-fearing individuals laid the foundations for what would later become the Canadian state. And another persistent myth in the development of, the, of Canada as we know it is that this development of Canada was not violent. Violence is the domain of the United States, when in fact, the reality is actually a little bit more complicated than that. Missing in this narrative of the enterprising European settler or pioneer um, that laid the foundations for what we call Canada is this understanding or this even questioning of what laws were created, by whom, and for what purposes. Now, it is beyond the scope of this conversation. But it's really important to really understand just how important the doctrine of discovery was to the conception of, Can of Canada and early what we call Canadian history. This doctrine of discovery basically posits that all of North America was a vast wilderness tamed by hardy Europeans. I distinctly remember even growing up here in, uh, in the as late as the mid 1990s. So I was grade eight, grade nine, and I remember distinctly reading in textbooks the official narrative being that Europeans were surprised to find the land inhabited by up as two by up to as many as two hundred thousand people in what is now Canada, when in fact the numbers were far higher prior to European contact. But you wouldn't know that when you take a look at the history of Canada, oftentimes. This history erases indigenous nations from Canadian history. And this history then is taught to future generation as fact in state sanctioned public education. So you have then at this point, <clears throat> excuse me, the replication of colonial narratives and colonial versions of history. You have this erasure of Indigenous history baked into the very fabric of Canada and Canadian history. So right there, you start to see the, the idea that systemic racism cannot exist in Canada as being very, very problematic when it is premised on the erasure of entire nations of other peoples. Right. So we're not going to be talking about residential schools today, um, but that is an outgrowth of that sort of common sense colonialism that people just assume when you don't ask these questions, when you don't ask who were the people that came here, when you don't ask, you know, why were the laws brought in the way that they were, why were they enacted the way they were, and for what purpose, these sorts of phenomena can emerge. It gets even more complicated now when we start talking about racialized immigrants. So oftentimes you'll see in the quest to become more Canadian, immigrants and refugees will have often aligned themselves with colonial narratives for the chance to attain some benefit associated with assimilation. And multiculturalism as a whole doesn't, doesn't provide opportunities to interrogate this, right? There is this sense of what it means to be Canadian, yes, but then anybody that falls within those margins has their own stories about how it relates to being Canadian. 
And in fact, when this sort of thing happens, it kind of treats, has the, te- has the potential to treat incidents of racism or conversations around race and racism. It tends to other, you know, these Canadian versus these other experiences. And when we do that, we, whether intentional or not, we often wind up lumping in Indigenous perspectives, Indigenous histories with the histories of, of marginalization encountered by newcomers to Canada. So in other words, multiculturalism has the potential itself to replicate these colonial narratives within. And this is important because migrants then who come to Canada, they again, they learn this history. They learn that this is what the dominant narrative means about Canadian society, about multiculturalism. So there is this push. Now, I know as settlement workers and as theorizers in, in, in settlement and migration, right, there is this understanding that there is a difference between assimilation and integration. And integration is very much a two-way street. And this is something we do stress in the Settlement Studies Diploma Program, as we stress to our students the idea that it's not just about making sure newcomers to Canada adapt to Canadian ways of doing things. It's about pushing the boundaries of what is popular discourse of what is seen to be common sense knowledge in Canadian society. But be that as it may, there still is a very strong push for migrants who wish to become citizens to and integrate into their into Canadian society to shed their labels as immigrants or refugees. Right? And you see this as well, even with a very, very simple question. Where are you from? If you are somebody who is seen as a racialized person, you are far more likely to be asked that question than someone who is not deemed to be racialized or someone who passes as white, right? So if you are Canadian and Canadian is supposed to be multicultural, then why is it that a person who is racialized gets asked where they are from more frequently? So this has implications for us as settlement workers and as scholars in the settlement sector and as government personnel who work with and fund service programming. What do we mean when we say settlement? We talk about, again, settlement as a process or continuum of activities that a newcomer goes through upon arrival in a new country. Shields, Drolet, and Valenzuela also go further and say that it includes adjustment, getting used to the new culture, language, and environment of the host community, adaptation, learning and managing new situations with a great deal of help, and integration, actively being engaged in contributing to the new community. So settlement services are therefore defined as programs and supports designed to assist immigrants to begin the settlement process and to help them make the necessary adjustments for a transition to life in their host communities. In Canada, settlement services are often tailored to meet the specific needs and circumstances of newcomers. And in the vast majority of cases, these are provided by various levels of government and government funded private and or nonprofit organizations. But although the settlement sector itself has a history of about 40, 50 years in Canada, and depending on your perspectives, maybe even a little bit longer if we include the role that that churches and faith based organizations played in the early 20th century, there have been some shifts over the last couple of two, two, three decades. Although the economic compatibility between migrants and the Canadian economy has always been a driving factor of immigration policy, new categories of, of immigrants were created by the government to flag applicants who could, be more, who could more easily contribute to local economies. Furthermore, beginning in the 1990s, most settlement service providers began to operate under a neoliberalized agency-based model where workers were expected to provide, again, individualized, specialized services and or group-based services. This has been met with criticism from scholars in the field of social work and other human service areas, such as Preston, George, and Silver, who contend that this is done at the expense of uh, developing a broader understanding of social issues and forces 
settlement workers to address symptoms instead of the causes of marginalization. Again, we don't want to engage in advocacy that might be overly critical of government policy. We might not want to upset the narrative of, multi of multiculturalism being insufficient if we rely on state funding that creates some potential problems with funders potentially down the road. So Gruner argues that an additional challenge is presented by professional discourses used in the settlement sector itself as the provision of settlement services is highly dependent on a migrant's legal status. In addition, Linda Maurice contends that learning is not only about acquiring important skills and knowledge, but is a much more holistic process that includes the body, mind, and emotions to interpret life experiences that are then integrated into an individual's autobiography and identity. So their history and their contemporary lived experiences. So this process of informal meeting happens regularly, and it's a process of meeting making that occurs on a daily basis. And it is one of the primary outcomes of social interactions between human beings. In other words, to the migrant, everything about a host country is new. Laws, norms, language, social spaces, so much of this is foreign. And the process of trying to shift so many frames of reference can be extremely disorienting. And learning through the settlement process then is very self-reflexive and it occurs at the intersection between your current experience and personal biography. And settlement workers have a massive role to play in that shifting of, of frames of reference. So how do you unpack this? What does this actually mean? Um, so the great Canadian myth has successfully permeated many of the values, attitudes, beliefs, and morals of our current society and set the parameters for what we assume uh, to be true, something that I like to call common sense knowledge. And this common sense knowledge forms the basis for everyday life, such that it is very difficult for us to even think of what something different might even look like or even conceive of it. So in other words, if we are willing to accept the idea that multiculturalism has a problematic element to it, and it has the potential and has been used to marginalize voices that would question the dominant narratives, there is difficult intellectual labor that has to be undertaken. And part of what it means then to be Canadian and what we teach newcomers about uh, to newcomers to Canada about Canada means we need to have a thorough understanding of colonialism and neoliberalism and how this has led to, you know, migration patterns in Canada and globally. So this sort of dialogic approach where we work with service users to try to understand their conceptions of, of where they are and the problems of what they are. It's about more than just giving them the services they need. It's about have, helping them make sense of their place in their new communities. That sense of place is fundamentally very, very, very important. And it's not just about, again, training the next generation of Canadian citizens and Canadian workers. It's about actually ensuring that people have the, they, they feel like there's a sense of belonging here. That can't happen if we continue to overlook very important problematic elements of our history. And we incorporate that into the initial interactions we have with newcomers to Canada. This is not something that distracts from settlement work. It is foundational, I would, I would argue, to settlement work that does not, that, that furthers the narrative in a truly egalitarian fashion. So when you do this kind of work and you interrogate narratives on a structural level, you can start to unpack the origins of a lot of common sense understandings that in turn will have consequences for workers themselves as well as they would a lot of things that you thought to be true and maybe aren't and you start to interrogate your own practices and you start to interrogate your own ways of being and knowing it's hard and it can be extremely destabilizing but the alternative is that we do what's easy and what's easy isn't necessarily what 
actually advances the cause of equity and justice, which is something that has been top of mind for much of the past decade, as we've talked about the outcomes of the TRC, we talked about the release of the reports into murder and missing Indigenous women and girls, and we continue to talk now about systemic anti-Black racism. Like These are just three very high-profile examples of the last 10 years. We would, we would be missing out on the opportunity to learn these very important lessons if we just treat them as though they are one-off situations. They are, these invite conversations of a much deeper level. They invite conversations that we should call, call us to question what it means to be a settlement worker, what it means to be a Canadian, and what it means to be committed to the values of equity and justice. So one way to think about this, and I'll leave it with this before I have a, li a little activity here and then I throw things over to Ashima, um, is to think about settlement work as pedagogic work. To newcomers to Canada, to service users, a settlement worker is, in essence, your first their first teacher. They teach the, the service users about you know, service, you know, whatever services are available about potentially, you know, uh, opportunities for housing. They, but more importantly, they are often the first time, the first points of contact for any sort of linguistic interactions and cultural interactions. So how to behave like a professional, what kind of dialect you speak, what kinds of slang are used right? Everything, if everything is new to the migrant when they arrive in Canada and the settlement worker is the first person that they meet, then it stands to reason that the settlement worker is in essence their first teacher. So it's important then for us to take that responsibility very, very seriously and to identify in our own practice and confront systemic issues that continue the cycles of oppression and exploitation today and to not fall into the trap to think that we live in a post-colonial or a post-racial world because we do not. The world is telling us this right now and Canada is not immune from that. It's not easy, it's not comfortable, but I would argue that it is extremely necessary. So we have to in essence, and this is part of a much larger conversation that we're not going to have time to talk about today, but I'm happy to have it with anybody, uh, you know, over email or in another time, is the idea that somehow, you know, we have to be, we have to reconcile the fact that as settlement workers, our industry has at times played a key role in the replication of colonial narratives with regards to you know Canada's relationship to indigenous peoples and the relate and the outcomes of that for newcomer indigenous relations if we don't recognize the role that this played again I, i'm sounding like a broken record here if we don't start to unpack the common sense understandings behind the great canadian myth that reinforce many of the eurocentric understandings of our world we will repeat those mistakes and 10 years from now we will be having these same conversations. So at this point, I am going to invite you all to uh, engage in a little bit, uh, humor me here. If you think that I'm being a little bit overly critical and overly negative, these are, th these are three pairs of really simple questions. Answer them. I'm not just, you know, there's no opportunity to engage in dialogue like this, but just copy and paste this and put this in the, in the, uh, in the chat box. I'll take a look at them. And maybe after, if, if we have time afterwards, I might even come back and give you the answers to these questions. But for those who maybe are, have, have a site uh, are, are unable to see, I'll read them out quickly here. So what are Canada's two official languages and what is the original word the origin of the word Canada. What nation has shaped our understanding of parliamentary democracy? What nation is considered by many to be practicing the oldest participatory democracy? Because they are not one and the same. And the third one is what was the importance of the War of 1812? 
And what was the importance of the Battle of Fish Creek in 1885? The answers to all three of those questions, the qu asking of the questions themselves is very important. I'd be willing to wager that 1A, 2A, and 3A are probably going to be easier or they'll, they'll be more reflexive to many of you than 1B, 2B, and 3B. And they would be for me as well. I am a product of Canadian society. So think about it, put your answers in the chat box. I'm very, very curious to see what you come up with. Uh, and then if we have time at the end, before we turn things over for the full Q&A, um, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll revisit the questions potentially. But with that, thank you all for your attention. Again, thank you very much for coming and spending time today. I will turn things over to my friend and esteemed colleague, Ashima. Um, so welcome everyone. Just nice to have you here with us today. Really looking forward to being a thinking partner with you. I have to admit that um, this kind of presentation style, we're talking about something that has to do with decolonization is actually a little contradictory, especially for me, who's more of a participatory facilitator. You know, I want to acknowledge that this space does not feel very relational. I know we're trying to mitigate that through technology, but that um, you know, if we had this in a different format, we'd discuss, we'd trade stories, we'd laugh, we'd be in constructive conflict, we'd be in more discomfort and learning. And that idea of being frictional, um, the point is to notice things when we have that space of friction together through all those ways of, of living and learning together. Um, as Alex mentioned, sort of, this is some of our initial thinking about what decolonization looks like and what being decolonial means for settlement work. Um, so I'm here to share what I've learned with you today, who I've learned from as many community members, many Indigenous people, scholars themselves, um, other people, BIPOC scholars, um, and people in community who have just shared so much, shared their wisdom. And this is really community-owned knowledge, the way I look at it, um, as we try to construct what a decolonial possibility for settlement work may look like. Um, territorial acknowledgements is fascinating. As I've been doing my own thinking about this, I actually acknowledge territory land treaty different every single time I do it to ensure that it is not just an exercise, but that I'm actually learning about what it means to be in treaty, what it means to be in a nation to nation relationship, and that nation even more than a name or land, but nation as political understanding, nation as social accountability and relationships nation as thinking beyond just people or citizens, but thinking about all the other life that exists. And this is a quote from Chelsea Bell, um, who is an Indigenous. She's a public and intellectual writer and educator, a great website there. But this is a quote from her, which says, moving beyond territorial acknowledgements mean asking hard questions about what needs to be done once we're aware of Indigenous presence. It requires that we remain uncomfortable, and it means making concrete disruptive change. And when I think about this acknowledgement as well, when I think about what Chelsea Val is saying here too, it makes me think about the map of what we think of as our land. So the settle, if you're part of a settlement agency or doing settlement work, whose land are you on? Also, what's the map of your organization? What's the history of your sector? Um, and what possibilities are open to you through acknowledging treaty or acknowledging land? Also, who has to cross borders based on the borders that have been constructed? Who has to cross borders in and out of your organization? Whose identity has to cross a border because of what we have taken for granted as the sites on which we are? So this is just a reflection as well on that. As I think about territorial acknowledgements, I've also been thinking about acknowledging Indigenous presence, life, learning, and resurgence. So not just to name things as we may name them, but to think about a different way of learning through that concept of nation or treaty. So I'm just going to read this. This is a quote from Leanne Betasimolke Simpson in uh, Naomi Klein, an interview with her. But in this quote, she talks about one of the things birds do in our creation stories is they plant seeds and they bring forth new ideas and they grow those ideas. Seeds are the encapsulation of wisdom and potential and the birds carry those seeds around the earth and they grew this earth. And I think we all have that responsibility to find those seeds, to plant those seeds, to give birth to these new ideas. Because people think up an idea, but then they don't articulate it, or they don't tell anybody about it, and they don't build a community around it, and they don't do it. So in Anashina Beg philosophy, if you have a dream, if you have a vision, 
you share that with your community and then you have a responsibility for bringing that dream forth or that vision forth into a reality. That's the process of regeneration. That's the process of bringing forth more life, getting the seed and planting and nurturing it. It can be a physical seed, it can be a child, or it can be an idea. But if you're not continually engaged in that process, then it doesn't happen. So I just want to give you a few minutes just to reflect on that as a different kind of acknowledgement and to think about what you may think of in your work um, as you reflect on that today. So as I reflect on this acknowledgement and what it means in the context of this presentation, I center myself on questioning whether the choices that are made on behalf of communities and people when it comes to settlement and integration actually brings forth more life. And it leads us to this question of what would a decolonial policy position on settlement actually look like? And so what I hope in this really snippet of time that we have together is to provide a little bit of conceptual clarity on what decolonization is. And so in my initial thinking of what decolonization or decolonial lens is. Also, when I talk about policy in this presentation, I'm really talking about all our ideas about how we work, live and play together the way we think about resources, I'm really thinking about policy from the macro to the micro level. So everything from the individual interactions we have, the choices we make on behalf of another or with one another. Um, so it's sort of the very soft policy up to that very hard policy on the macro level, the UN, IRCC, the decisions that they make, that's Immigration, Refugees, Citizenship, Canada. Um, how do they choose either a course of action or inaction? Choosing not to do something is also a policy position. And that's something that I sort of wanted to highlight in terms of the way I might use that terminology today. So what is decolonization? And this quote is from Harsha Walia. And she says, decolonization is more than a struggle against power and control. It is also the imagining and generating of alternative institutions and relations. So it's a form of resistance. It's about dismantling the current structures that exist, but it is also about thinking about a new society based on terms that we often throw around in our policies and our other ideas of things like equity, mutual aid, self-determination, and it is about a paradigm shift. So it's not just about looking at what exists and trying to tear it down. Um, in the words of feminist, uh, black feminist scholar, Audre Lorde, she, you know, her famous quote is always, the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. They may temporarily beat them at his own game. And this is a little bit, there's a parallel there to this kind of decolonial work is that, you know, if we're trying to take down the master's house, how to speak, so to speak, what's the new house that we're moving into? What happens after the post-colonial? And how is decolonial different than an anti-colonial or a post-colonial situation as well? So when I think about decolonization as this idea of sort of thinking through what are the structures and the systems that sort of desire that determine who is worthy. So as Alex was talking about some of his ideas in his presentation is who is a worthy Canadian, who is seen as belonging, who has this idea of citizenship, um, who, who decides um, who bestows those kinds of things on people? And then who is in the line of not deserving? Where are the borders drawn between? Who does not actually get access to those things? Um, you know, and how is this related to other things? Like uh, Alex just touched on this, but the neoliberal understandings of how our economy works, the way our systems work, um, and how that influences our practice on the ground. Another thing I wanted to mention when we talk about decolonization and imagining alternative institutions is that the governments we have are born of colonial logics. So if we think that they are the appropriate site of decolonial policy making, we may want to rethink when it comes to settlement and integration, are we going to wait for a government policy position that comes out using these words? Or are we generating alternatives from different sites and spaces that can do that paradigm shift? And that's the thing I think that's difficult when we sometimes think about a decolonial lens is that it, it's a it's a it's a um, paradigm shift. It's not just um, struggling against what it, what exists. So how do we ensure that decolonization is not just another buzzword? So these might be some of the promises that we often have in our organizations, our institutions, even our scholarly work. It's these promises that we give people newcomers who come to Canada. Um, people who are here as settlers, these promises of equality, justice, citizenship, 
full participation. And it's interesting because we keep recycling these same words in different frameworks that are supposed to be about things like um, social inclusion, equity, liberation, however you may say it. So how does decolonization, decolonization make an impact that's different than, or maybe complementary to equity, diversity, inclusion, anti-racism, uh, intersectionality, which is common now in policy approaches as a framework of gender-based analysis plus, or multiculturalism when it comes to policy work. Um, so looking at all these different terms, it's sort of like we keep coming up with new frameworks to do this work of bringing about equality or justice or full participation. And when you look at the work on the ground, um, often these things are not emerging for a great swath of society. Um, and we look at newcomer communities themselves and the own intersections of their identity. Are we actually seeing these things come about through these frameworks? And when we see these same things coming up, um, what does it mean? So if you look at equity, diversity, and inclusion, that's often working within the system as it exists. It's thinking about what is the diversity within the, um, the society as it exists, as we think about it. Um, inclusion, how do we value those differences? Equity gets into a sort of deeper space of trying to dismantle structures. Um, Anti-racism, we're really looking at things like power, privilege, and prejudice. We're looking at power and how that operates, who decides, who doesn't decide. Um, intersectionality is a really interesting one because it's become a little bit more of the new buzzword. Um, but if you really look at intersectionality's origins, it's interesting to see who is erased in terms of um, thinking about what intersectionality means which can be a very deep um, thinking about how we work in relation with each other, how we think through different paradigms or through different lenses, and how we work coalitionally. coalitionally. So how do we work in coalition together? And those coalitions are messy. They're difficult. Um, so it's not just about a better policy. It's really about getting outside of the system that exists. And some of these things to various levels allow us to get outside the system that exists. Um, but some of them still work primarily within the system of our organizations, the system of policy making. So it's not so much about alternative policies, it's actually about alternative to policy. Alternative to policy as we think about that right now. Who makes it? Who says how it works? Um, who, do we, who do we also alienate our own power to when we think about who determines the policies that we work under, we live under, and we also um, all implicate ourselves in, in the way that we work within policy. And are these things you strive for? So if you think about, and I'll give you a, just a second to think about that, if you strive for equality, if you strive for justice, if you strive for citizenship, if you strive for full participation, on whose terms are you striving for when you think about those things? So decolonization is not a metaphor. And this is the title of um, an article by Eve Tuck and Wayne Yang. Um, which has, I have a, a reference to it later, but that has gone around a lot thinking about decolonial thinking, especially in the academy. Um, and they're talking about how, you know, you can't just say decolonize schools, we're going to decolonize our thinking, we're going to decolonize all these things, is that decolonization is much more than just saying we're going to do something. It actually makes it, it goes back to making those difficult decisions about how we do our work. Another way of thinking about this is what's the problem we're trying to solve through a decolonial approach? What is the problem you're trying to solve? When you came to a session on decolonial work and settlement work, uh, what was the problem you're trying to solve by thinking through this lens? Another way of asking this is what's wrong with the way we do things now? What will look different about the way you work if you take on this decolonial work? What would feel radically different? What would feel difficult or uncomfortable? In this quote, I won't read it all out, but one of the things I just want to highlight is that in this quote, it says, what I want to leave behind is in the justice. I wish that we could start again. And starting again is that place of thinking about how things could look different, radically different. So settlement for whom and settlement for what? So one of the lessons I think I've had in decolonial thinking is getting back to really, really simple questions lead us on that pathway. So some of these basic questions are who defines what settlement and integration are and who do those definitions benefit? 
And I just want to give you a second to think about what's your working definition of settlement and integration and where do they come from? So I'll even give you a minute just to think about it. You might want to write it down, which would be a powerful piece of being a little bit relational in this presentation. But what is your definition of those things? How did you learn them and where did they come from? So the most basic questions I like to ask is that idea of settlement for whom and settlement for what? And that might be another place that you want to go in your thinking. Who is settlement for? Who is it a system for? Who are we benefiting? And what do we achieve? So if we follow settlement policy around, where does it go? Who does what with it? Politicians, organizations, practitioners. And then are you thinking about Indigenous peoples, newcomers, the public? What do Indigenous peoples do with settlement policy? How about newcomers themselves? What do they do with it? Who does what with it? How about the public? So if we follow it around and we look at things like, um, if you look at Hansard, so the dialogues that politicians have in the parliament or the legislatures, when you look at some of these other texts about who does what with settlement policy at those levels, we often see a connection to an economic system. We often see the thinking about newcomers to Canada as contributing to an economy. And some of the things that Alex sort of mentioned and highlighted when uh, Thobani was thinking about the common sense understandings of what makes a good Canadian. So things like industriousness, you know, making sure that you're hardworking and that you're contributing and you're compassionate and all of these kinds of things. So it's interesting to think about these things. Who does what with it? And who is not even thought of as doing something with it? And why not? Why are those people left out of that dialogue? What are some of the contradictions that emerge when it comes to settlement policy, when it comes to our policies around newcomers to Canada? And are they a sign of a system that needs to be fixed or a system that is working exactly as is intended to function? So some of the contradictions that come up when we think about policy sometimes is we believe in healthcare. It's a Canadian right. It's something that we really believe in. And, uh, and um, surveys often show that this is really important to Canadians. But refugee claimants, they don't deserve access. Are we going to take it away or we're going to create this dialogue where you have to be deserving to have this? Why does that contradiction kind of emerge? What are the lines of our generosity and our understanding of what health means for communities or people? Or we're about family values, but parents and grandparents now need a super visa. And you're going to have to take, you have to be in a lottery um, and you have to work really hard to actually get into this system. But we're all about family values, which leads us to whose families are we talking about? What kind of contributions do we value family members? What's formally counted within what we call an economy, the contributions of those people as being economically viable or advantageous? And where do we not even think about those things? Or we're humanitarian, but refugee claimants are unfunded. And I know through some settlement agencies, even work here in Edmonton, is that some of their work, a large uh, proportion of their work, actually goes to refugee claimants as unfunded work because they're not thought of as people worthy or they're within these borders of what we define to be who is a migrant who we want to bring formally into society, access to citizenship, access to services, temporary foreign workers, there was a similar kind of dialogue around and more services now. But it really goes back to who is invisible in policy and why. Who does not have access to the benefits of policy and is our goal really to make people more visible within policy or is it to think differently about what policy even is? So for example, if the secondary list there, if Indigenous peoples, newcomers and the public did something with settlement policy actively, what would they do with it and why? So two other things just I wanted to touch on as well is before I get into some examples, getting concrete into what decolonization in settlement work might look like, is this idea of settler complicity versus settler privilege. And so sometimes settlers do not have privilege. So racialized settlers, settlers who come from their own histories of colonization, those who are fleeing violence and other situations. Um, Indigenous scholar Jody Bird in her book, book Transit of Empire actually makes a distinction between what she calls arrivants and settlers. Um, and arrivants are those because of the forces of colonization, their own lands have been pushed and they have less of a choice. It is more, you know, some people don't have a choice about coming to Canada. And so you may experience different forms of either settler privilege or settler marginalization, but that does not take you away from being complicit in being a settler. 
And that acknowledgement can be really important because sometimes people resist this. They say, but you know what? I don't have privilege in this system, but my family's in poverty, but I'm really struggling, but I can't find a job. And all of those things are very true is that you may not experience settler privilege, but as long as we tie value to land, as long as we, we tie value to being in a settler colonial state, then we won't actually dismantle that system. So it's being able to say, I don't have privilege as a settler. I don't have the benefits of some of the things within this society or paradigm that I have, but I'm still complicit in seeing land as value. I'm still complicit in taking a piece of that and trying to do something through those logics of um, economy and land as they exist in that settler society. And I won't get into this, but um, Tuck and Yang in their 2012 article as well, Decolon Decolonization is Not a Metaphor, talk a lot about settler moves to innocence. And these are the things you may see in your own work or in policy or in other systems about trying to rescue settler future futurity. And all of these things, it's always about, but what if, what would happen to us? Does this mean that now we'll be marginalized and we'll be disempowered by that system? Does it mean just trading one form of power for another? But as I say, decolonization is not an and, it is an elsewhere. And so it's thinking about an elsewhere very strongly. The other thing I'll touch on is this idea of what does epistemic disobedience mean in practice? Now, this is one of those loaded academic words. And often I like not to pick on those words too much because they're such a specialized term that can be, um, you know, they keep some people out. But I wanted to touch on this because the episteme or talking about being epistemic is a way we think about knowledge. What counts as knowledge? Whose knowledge counts as valuable? What do we recognize as being valid or not? And so be being disobedient means actually thinking from the colonial different. It means thinking from the other line. So when you talked about things like, are we looking for more representation within policy? Are we thinking about rethinking what that even, how that even exists? Whose knowledge exists? Whose knowledge is valuable? How do we actually think differently? And so this is the thing is that we want to actually be a little bit disobedient. And in a second, when I'm talking about decolonial possibilities, it means in our organizations, we actually have to be comfortable with creating uh, an environment and a framework where we see epistemic disobedience. So it's not just about having greater representation. Oh, look at us. We're so diverse. We have all these people from all over. That's great. But are you epistemic disobedient within your organization? Which means do you actually think of knowledge production, the way knowledge is produced, the way knowledge is used and knowledge is recognized differently? Because if you're not, then you're not on the path to decolonization yet. So dreaming of some decolonial possibilities, and this is my favorite part about thinking through new lenses, is the creativity, the kind of problem solving, that idea of the impossibility of thinking that. It's like, let's do that. Let's do that thing that just seems really impossible. So some of the things is that the settlement worker cannot replace or do the work of being in relation with Indigenous peoples, communities, and nations. And often in our organizations, we'll have a special project, some workers are assigned to go do some of this work um, or to give information. The solution becomes, let's give people information about indigenous peoples, let's produce a pamphlet, let's do this. That actually is counter to this idea of being deeply in relation and the time it takes to actually do that work. So how do we think about these possibilities? What would it look like if we blew apart that paradigm and we actually put uh, newcomers to Canada, as Alex was saying, you know, if you're the first teacher, you're the first point of contact, how are you not the intermediary and how do we not have texts or other things mediating them? How do we actually categorically put people together instead of break them apart? What would that look like? Um, I realize I'm missing a few words on this next bullet point, which I'll amend when we upload this, but uh, not fixing people into categories and asking them to catch up or develop. These are some of the colonial words that can be in our thinking, in our policies, and the way we think about doing our work. What would it look like if we didn't have refugee claimant versus refugee versus temporary foreign worker versus some of these terms that we use to determine who's seen in policy and who gets distribution of the benefits in different kinds of ways. Also thinking about who, what are we developing to? Are we developing to something where we sort of give up our ideas and our situations um, or are we actually developing something new? So that's an interesting one as a decolonial possibility to me. Uh, rethinking the credentials required to do settlement and integration work. 
Is it a master's of social work? I know with IRCC, we've had some interesting conversations around this and in the community and with other organizations, with colleagues doing settlement work, with colleagues doing other forms of work, with Indigenous colleagues and organizations themselves. What is the credentials to do settlement work? Is it to you know, have a formal social work degree or training? Is it something else? Rethinking the term settlement and integration, I think I've touched on this a lot, but going to those very simple, very basic questions. Um, playing the politics of refusal. So there's some examples here too, where for example, again, we're gonna touch on things like RCC and other funders and other policy positions. But sometimes, you know, they say, well, you have to do it this way. There's going to be one agency, they have to do all of case management, or there's going to be one agency, and they're going to do all of this. And politics of refusal, which um, Audra Simpson, some of, her, some of her work really touches on this, but it's about actually saying, no, we're not going to do it that way. And I often think about this when funding calls come out. I know in my own work, maybe not specifically about settlement, but sometimes about other funding that comes out, the way they state the outcome outcomes of what we're trying to do in the community are so counter or harmful to the way we think about our, the, our communities and they continue to tell a story that is really damaging. Um, so politics of refusal is actually saying what if all of us decided to say to the government whether that's a provincial funder or municipal or federal none of us are applying for this pocket of money because we don't believe in the way you've written those outcomes or we don't believe what you're actually saying about communities why don't you go amend it and then we'll go apply for the money. And there's always that danger that they'll just take the money, they'll, they won't actually give it to us anymore, and they'll just take the whole pot away. But it's also about how do we collectively, when we all know it's wrong and we all continue to participate, how do we actually play a politics of refusal with that? And refusing damage-centered research, which is continuing to tell the pain of communities and stories over and over again with no accountability for doing anything different with that, that work. Um, so this is something, you know, I think a lot about in my own work is kind of refusing to do this. And when somebody asks us to do a community-based research project and we've told them over and over and over again the stories of communities for 20, 30 years about how childcare for newcomer communities is not working, how the intersection of poverty and employment and other factors have realities in the, in the uh, lives of families and nothing ever changes. It's about turning the lens up to see what actually the people in positions of decision-making power and resource power are doing with that, rather than turning the lens down into our communities over and over again and saying, what's broken with you? What's not working? Tell me again, tell me again. And this refusal of damage-centered research um, is something that I find really interesting. Um, supporting the diversity of epistemic locations and not just looking at social locations. So I sort of touched on this in the last slide, but it's not so much about saying, oh, check, we have somebody on our board. They have this, this, this identity. Are they actually going to think from a different position than a Eurocentric mainstream approach, uh, a white supremacist approach? You know, those sort of mainstream ideas that we have about organizations, the way we do things, the way we structure meetings, who speaks and why, uh, what community accountability looks like, their comfort in different spaces. So are we looking at a diversity of epistemic locations, the way people think about knowledge, the way we operate, or just our social location? So are we just looking at social identity in and of itself? Um, and newcomers as thinking partners, rethinking what citizenship, success, and belonging actually look like. So what would it look like if newcomers were both thinking partners within settlement work of rethinking these things and going back to the first point and sort of cycling around in this circle is that also what would that look like truly in relation with Indigenous peoples, communities and nations to do some of that work. So that in a very <laughs> quick nutshell is sort of the end of uh, this, this little snapshot into this thinking of what decolonization might look like in settlement work. Um, and, you know, Fanon really said, he said, decolonization is a change in the order of the world. So I hope that from this presentation and from this thinking, it sort of just shakes up that order of the world for you a little bit. You may feel resistance to it. You may think it's impossible. But part of this work is trying to make the impossible possible. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ashima and Alex. Uh, very insightful and actually quite inspiring uh, presentation. So thank you very much for that. Um, I'm just going to go quickly here. Uh, in the interest of time, I'd like to just go straight into uh, the comments and or questions that people have. And the first one is for Alex. 
Uh, I'll just read it out and then uh, Alex, maybe you can just address it. Um, the question is, how can we conciliate your insightful suggestions with the fact that settlement workers are undertrained, if any, rarely supported by external supervisors, mental health, but also PD and experience high turnover? Yeah, that's a really important question and a really, really good question to ask. And I think it all comes back to, you know, something Ashima said at the towards the beginning of hers and gives us a clue as to how we can do this. It's about the relationship. If we're talking about fundamentally altering the way that we relate to one another, then this can't just be up to the individual frontline settlement worker to take on, to shoulder on for themselves. This is a much bigger conversation that needs to happen. So I'll give you a concrete example of something that didn't happen when I was working in the field versus what is happening more of now as a step in the right direction. So when I was working in the field, there was very little interaction and overlap between settlement agencies and indigenous serving agencies. They kind of led very separate parallel uh, lives, even though that many of the same concerns that newcomers to Canada and newcomers to Edmonton who happen to be indigenous, but from maybe more remote northern communities, many, many of the challenges are, are, are similar even though that the histories and, uh, and, and the, many of the challenges are different. So one way to do this is to actually have, go back to square one, go back to the very beginning and say, okay, we recognize that these are very complicated conversations that we need to have. We need to reset and rebuild this relationship from scratch. So as settlement agencies, the responsibility should be on leaders within those agencies to initiate those conversations so that there is on a structural level, an opportunity for individuals who support newcomers and individuals who support Indigenous peoples to cross-pollinate, work together, grow together, uh, and, and support, you know, the divergent communities that they, they do it more collaboratively. That also implies that this, that there needs to be advocacy on a higher level to actually shake up and break down the silos that exist within funding models so that there isn't this pressure placed on by above by government to continue to atomize and individualize. Beyond that, at an individual level, what settlement workers can do is at the very least, again, many people in this field are very smart, they're very skilled, they're very intelligent, and they're very experienced in many different ways. Providing people an opportunity, you know, institutionally to go and learn. To And by learning, I mean unlearning, right? So having those mechanisms in place institutionally is also that. So there's, but a lot of it has to start small. Like these are big, big conversations, but if we start with big ideas and big solutions where we've overlooked the, you know, the actual minute of the day-to-day -day interruptions between communities and individuals, then we're going to just wind up back here again. It has to be a fundamental restructuring of how we relate to one another. Thank you very much, Alex. Um, very interesting answer. The, uh, the next question is directed at, uh, at Shima, and I'll just read it out. So in the case of Atlantic Canada, settlement is solely led by white funders and educators' discussions on racism are shut down and dismiss, how do we create accountability in such spaces? Yeah, that's a really great question. And some of this I know when people hear this work is what's under my control, especially if you're excited about it. And sometimes it's even thinking about in the scope of the work you do, whether that's directly with community, say you facilitate conversations with community, whether that's one on one, whether that's in group settings. How do you just bring some of these kinds of decolonial questions into your space and even just planting those seeds on that level is something that can start building a movement a little bit you know within the scope of what we can do from the bottom up and i think that work is always important work as well um, it's interesting in terms of a social identity of the people who may be funders and eds um, and the thing is are any of those people actually thinking differently hopefully there's some opportunities and we talk about social identity versus epistemic identity. So the idea of people who might be thinking differently, 
if there's some allies in that work or people who can actually have opportunities to to think with you and be a thinking partner, that's an important place to go as well. Um, the other thing is, you know, we have a lot of work to do. Um, often I think if there's even one thing that you can promote in your organization and learn through doing the work, because again, this is a journey of learning. So even if you said, okay, um, and often maybe using decolonization is not the language that organizations are ready for. Maybe use the language of inclusion, maybe use the language of equity, uh, maybe use the language of anti-racism, but you infuse some of these ideas of decolonization within them. And sometimes you have to start from there because we do work with, within power structures and we do also have to start where people are at when we're trying to influence those things. So sometimes it's thinking, okay, you might not use the word decolonize, but you're actually thinking about how we do you actually use a decolonial approach to orientation in our organization. What would it look like to rethink that? Oh, hey, I have an idea and these are some of the things that I'm thinking of or you just use that question of orientation for whom and orientation for what just those two questions I find are my very powerful back pocket questions that you can choose just one or two areas and if the organization starts doing that work they start learning about that work and people get you know just in my in the more um, psychosocial sort of way that people feel about their organization I think everybody wants to be doing something new and engaging and different it gives us new motivation to do our work so if you find what we sometimes call a 15% solution, what's that 15% that's within your control or your influence? And if you can work through that, it can make the work feel much more um, accessible rather than something that's so big that we can't take it apart. Thank you, Nishima. I have um, a comment kind of question here um, that I'll read out. Uh, it's I think it's directed at, uh, at both of you. Um, how is this work done safely? This implies that the environments that this work needs to be done are safe or ready with organizations that are still inherently colonial in practice and approach as held by decision makers and funders. Oh, ah, that's a great question. Um... How do you decolonize a colonial institution, right? I mean, that's ultimately what it, uh, how I read that question. And um, again, like the, I think it has to go back to what we, what we mean, like what work are you referring to? Like what work do you want to do? Is it something that's about, like, are you looking at a, reworking a policy? Are you looking at re? designing a service are you looking at building a relationship between you know a, a you know a community and an indigenous nation right i mean these all are very very different questions and very different ideas that would necessitate a very different approach so in terms of how to do it safely um you know i don't know if you can I don't know if there is something if you if there's any work here that's done without risk because there are there is an inherent resistance that that will come up there's a reason why these systems of power and privilege exist the way they are and power never gives up anything without a fight right any if you take a look historically at any sort of changes and evolutions we've seen in our society that have been for the benefit of people who have historically been marginalized it has not been because proposals have been written and sensible arguments have been had and a and a, and a well placed argument has carried the day it has been that there have been opportunities to actually engage in more direct forms of action. So how can you do this safely? There are plenty of social movements out there that are already doing a lot of heavy lifting to do exactly this, right? I mean, the Black Lives Matter movement is a prime example of a community-based movement that has actually really blown the doors open and provided an opportunity for us to have an actual conversation about what it means to address systemic anti-black racism in a place like Canada. The Idle No More movement um, and, and, the, and the, the, the TRC provided another opportunity. I would argue that we have not taken full advantage of that opportunity because the, of the questions that it raises and the implications of it would raise, you know, there, <laughs> you follow it through to its logical conclusions and there's some pretty big, uh, there's some pretty big work that, that we need to do. And I'm not sure that people in 
positions of power are really all that interested in doing in and actually following through on that. So I don't know. So I, I know that's not the best answer, but I think we can take a look. There's this perception that work is not being done, that it's up to us as settlement workers to do it. And there's a lot of resistance that's already happening in community. And I think a lot of times our sector as the settlement sector is disconnected from that energy. So finding a way to tap into that and add to it is I think a really great way to do things safely without the feeling the need to take on more than you can do. Hashima, did you want to add anything to that? Yeah, maybe I'll just touch on things like no one is illegal is another movement to look at, which looks at migrant justice, but largely through a decolonial lens. Um, touching on the things that Alex said. Also, in terms of safe environments, don't forget that our, um, you know, when you look at people who've come from different places, they also have knowledge of colonization and what decolonization could look like, as well as Indigenous communities themselves. So you don't have to, as Alex was saying, you don't have to feel like I need to do all that thinking. There is so much thinking throughout history that has been happening has happened so sometimes it's touching into those things but for that really real idea of what's a safe environment for you within an organization um, sometimes it's looking at your colleagues it's working in allyship in really smart and coalitional kind of ways um, it could be colleagues in other organizations it could be colleagues who aren't directly like if you're in a settlement who's maybe in a family serving organization a community serving organization that can be your ally in thinking through the, some of this work, sharing tools, developing different things. Um, so try to find something that gives you a little bit of a, that safe space to work in and to strategize. It takes a relational approach. And I think these other thing is that um, our societies and our institutions tend to be very individual based. So how do you think of a coalitional relational approach to trying to get um, a safe space in different kinds of ways? Thanks very much, uh, Ashima and Alex. Um, if, uh, I'd just like to say that uh, if you have any additional questions that right now, um, we're getting lots of really nice comments. So thank you for that. Um, if there are any other questions that you would like our presenters to address, um, I think we have a minute. If I may, um, you know, since we do have a couple minutes here, I said it, I, I kind of left it out there that there, I had a couple questions uh, that I posed to the audience and, uh, and, and, you know, I can, I can circle back to them and give the answers as it were. Um, so the questions again, 1A, what are Canada's two official languages? Very, very few of us would not know the answer to that is English and French. But how many of you, how many of the people sitting in this room right now would know the origin of the word Canada itself? The origins of the word Canada is actually Haudenosaunee, right? It's, it's a, a Haudenosaunee word that means community or village. Yet, <laughs> in your Welcome to Canada guide, that's, that information is not there. In a lot of textbooks around this, maybe now, post-TRC calls to action, you start to see a little bit more of that there. But for the longest time, Canada was not even recognized as being an Indigenous word. This is the kind of common sense erasure, common sense knowledge we're talking about. So what nation shaped our understanding of parliamentary democracy? Great Britain and the Westminster system, first past the post, you know, all that sort of stuff. But in terms of what nation is considered by many to be the oldest consistent participatory democracy, again, it's the Haudenosaunee nation. They've been practicing participatory democracy since 1142, nonstop in their own communities. Again, 1142, participatory democracy. And the last one, what was the importance of the War of 1812? It was the last military conflict that happened on Canadian soil against a foreign nation. But the Battle of Fish Creek in 1885 was the last time the Canadian military was defeated on Canadian soil during the Northwest Rebellion. So these are the kinds of things that are super important for us to know because they challenge the dominant narratives. And I would wager that many of us who work in settlement sector have not been exposed to a lot of these things. And if you don't know this history, 
then it's very, very difficult to avoid making a lot of the same mistakes from it. That's all I want to say on that. Thanks very much, uh, Alex. Thank you to uh, both of our presenters, Alex and Ashima. We uh, really thought provoking uh, discussion and great questions to everybody. Uh, we are uh, out of time. And uh, thank you all for joining us here today. Yes, and thank you to P2P for uh, for sneaking us in for one more one more panel right at the very end of April. This is, uh, yeah, this is great. Thank you, and thank you to everyone for coming. Yeah, thanks very much, everyone.